Hi, this is Kevin Trainer. Welcome to my lecture on Chapter 12 of Kathy Schwalbe's book, Information Technology Project Management, 8th edition. Chapter 12 is entitled Project Procurement Management. So uh, procurement means acquiring goods or services from an outside source. Um, other terms for procurement that you may be more familiar with are purchasing and outsourcing. Expert, experts that predict that global spending on computer software and services will continue to grow. Garner estimated the value of the global IT industry at uh, $3.8 trillion. Uh, so people... <clears throat> People buy a lot of their IT goods and services from the outside rather than producing them themselves, okay? In particular, um, there is a whole industry called uh, IT outsourcing that uh, has a particular history that is important to know about. Okay, so um, people can you to continue to debate whether uh, offshore outsourcing helps their own country or not. So a lot of IT jobs and a lot of IT projects have been uh, given to outside organizations. They've been outsourced. And those organizations, at least the labor for those organizations, is uh, uh, not in the U.S. It's in places like uh, India and the Philippines and uh, China. So there are some people who think that's good. There are some people who think uh, that that's bad. Um, a recent approach to bringing IT jobs back to the U.S. is called urban onshoring especially for functions like software testing. For example, the Urban Development Center model develops the infrastructure, resources, and jobs in low-income neighborhoods to provide technology education, training, and job placement services for over 4,500 unemployed and low-income adults in New York City. So if we're going to put some underemployed uh, people to work rather than put underemployed people to work halfway around the world. The idea here is put underemployed uh, people to work uh, right here. Uh, not everybody agrees about IT outsourcing. So uh, some companies such as Walmart prefer to do no outsourcing at all, while others do a lot. Um, now, Walmart is a, 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 an interesting employer because they're uh, they're pretty much a low cost operation. So they they really their their uh, value add is is their ability to buy things for less than other people do, and that is that extends to the labor as well. So in a world where they're uh, pretty stingy in what they pay labor. The savings to be had in outsourcing are perhaps not that great. Uh, so perhaps their aversion to outsourcing has uh, something to do with their uh, labor cost structure compared to others. Um, GM recently announced uh, plans to switch from outsourcing 90% of its IT services to only 10%. And the history of outsourcing at GM is really, really interesting. Uh, GM, at a certain point, um, was doing a lot of work with a company called uh, EDS, uh, Electronic Data uh, Systems, who was a, a big outsourcer before we called it outsourcing. And um, eventually, um, the companies merged, and the the head of EDS, a fellow named Ross Perot, 
uh, who eventually ran for president, um, he uh, came to GM and uh, he owned so much of the GM stock, he, he made a play to, uh, to run the company. Uh, and he was uh, rebuffed and uh, they eventually spun them off and all that kind of stuff. But they're, uh, so um, a GM actually combined itself with an IT services uh, company and now we're seeing the, the, the bitter end of that uh, kind of uh, integration. Most organizations do some form of outsourcing to meet their IT needs and spend most money within their own uh, country. Okay, but they don't always do all the work themselves, they like outsource. The U.S. temporary workforce continues to grow as people work for temporary job agencies so they can more easily move from company to company. So particularly in the IT area, the use of people as contractors uh, rather than employees um, has been popular for mm, certainly 40 years, probably 50 years. U.S. companies are transferring more work abroad, especially in the areas of IT infrastructure, application development, and maintenance and innovation processes. India, China, and the Philippines are the preferred locations for outsourcing, and Latin America is growing in popularity. And what's really happening here is uh, just the cost of labor is lower in these other places. A shortage of qualified personnel, not cost savings, is the top reason for global outsourcing of IT services. Now, this is the top reason given, okay? But I'm going to tell you that I think that money talks, nobody walks, okay? Um, it's the shortage of qualified personnel at this cost level that leads to these kinds of outsourcing deals. Um, here's a what went right slide. So here's something that's sort of headed in the other direction. Retailer Zulily develops software in-house to meet their needs for speed and innovation. So they're not outsourcing that work. Their proprietary algorithms track the customers and make adjustments to meet changing consumer preferences. They believe you have to build the technology from scratch to fit your market perfectly. So uh, here is a, uh, a, a, a an organization that believes that uh, uh, developing IT systems is part of their competitive advantage and not one that they want to turn over to some other organization. Why outsource? Um, to access skills and technologies to reduce the both fixed and recurrent costs, to allow the client organization to focus on its core business this is often uh, claimed when uh, the client organization says that our core business is not IT. It's uh, banking. It's retailing. It's uh, whatever. And so we don't want to put a large part of our energy and focus into IT. We'd rather to just have a bill to pay. Some other reasons to provide flexibility and to increase accountability. The accountability idea is that uh, some people think that internal organizations uh, are only so accountable, largely because you can't fire them, and that external organizations are more accountable because you can fire and replace them. Um, your mileage may vary. Uh, so whatever we are buying from the outside, whether it's very big uh, 
very big uh, purchases of uh, projects or services or goods or, or uh, small purchases of the same. It's typical for there to be a contract in place. So what are contracts and what are they for? Well, a contract is a mutually binding agreement that obligates the seller to provide the specified products or services and obligates the buyer to pay for them. Contracts can clarify responsibilities and sharper focus on key deliverables of a project. Because contracts are legally binding, there's more accountability for delivering the work as stated in the contract. And um, it's kind of interesting here because um, this uh, difference between the accountability of internal organizations and the, the accountability of external suppliers is certainly there is a perceived uh, difference. And um, uh, I just want to point out that um, there's less of a difference than I think you would initially imagine okay so to the extent that um, organizations are adopting formal approaches to project management and they are working to manage expectations throughout the lifetime of a project a part of those expectations is accountability okay so um, uh, the internal groups that are not acting in an accountable way are probably not doing all the things that we are recommending in our formal approach to project management. So we're, I think in some ways, understating the accountability of the internal people. And on the other hand, we are, uh, I think, overstating the accountability of the external people, okay? Um, uh, two, two reasons uh, here. Uh, one is that just because you have a contract that's legally binding, that doesn't say that it's a good substitute for working with a supplier who um, meets your needs. So if you sign up a supplier and they don't meet their needs and they signed a contract, so they breached the contract, so you, your needs are not met and you have the potential for a lawsuit. In most organizations, that's not considered a, a success, okay? Lawsuits are seen as a failure. So um, it's probably better than hiring uh, some kind of an organization that doesn't meet your needs and you don't have the potential for a lawsuit. But um, you would do better to have an organization that's going to meet your need. The other idea is uh, a lot of people have a concept that because, uh, because you have a contract with... Um, some kind of a uh, supplier that you have the right to terminate, that you have some power over them that you might not over, have over some kind of internal group. But especially with these very big outsourcing contracts, you have the reality that um, you, uh, you know, let's say you give over 100% of your IT activity to a big uh, company, um, you're not going to break that contract over one dispute, right? It, it costs a lot of money to put that in place. You probably, when they took over your IT, they probably hired a bunch of your former IT workers as employees. They bought your hardware. They bought your software. These things are not easily undone. So uh, to the extent that you've got a group of people who are doing all your IT on the outside, um, they may be, uh, in theory, more accountable, but your uh, recourse is not terrifically different than with uh, 
than with uh, your own internal group. What went wrong? Okay, some of these things that are purchased from the outside have gone wrong. Uh, we've had a lot of problems with um, in the public uh, sector with uh, contracts for projects. Um, one of the troubles that the public sector has is in managing um, their finances. And this, uh, a lot of people would attribute to the fact that when you're spending money in the public sector, you're spending other people's money. Well, this is true to some extent in the private sector as well, but the perception is uh, different. So in New York City in 2011, uh, the mayor acknowledged that City Hall had mismanaged its major IT projects and vowed to improve their oversight. The prosecutor said that the $700 million price tag for the city time payroll system was inflated by fraud and the mayor demanded a $600 million refund from the main contractor. Wow. $700 million sounds like a lot of money for a payroll system. Uh, the automated personnel system NICAPS suffered significant uh, delays and cost overruns due to leadership issues, increasing from an original estimate of $66 million to over $363 million. So at least in the public sector, we have uh, some of these uh, black swans, some of these things where they have, they have really big, uh, really big cost overruns. And the fact that they're dealing with outside people doesn't seem to have uh, prevented a really big uh, cost overrun experience. So um, this assumption that there is uh, greater accountability on the outside than the inside um, is, I think, largely unproven. It's a, it's a common perception and I think there, you know, there is, there is a truth in it, but it's not universally true. And certainly, you can see uh, some pretty expensive uh, counterexamples, like the um, the things on this uh, slide. So now we've come to the part of the chapter where we. We identify the processes that are part of this knowledge area. So within the, um, the project procurement management knowledge area are included the processes planning procurement management, conducting procurements, controlling procurements, and closing procurements. And here's how they fall into the process groups. So in the planning process group is plan procurement management. In the executing, conduct procurements. In the monitoring and controlling, control procurements. And very interestingly here, we have something that, that is officially in the closing um, uh, process uh, group, which is close procurements. And we'll be talking about that um, later on. So uh, planning. Well, just like the rest of the knowledge areas, we're expected to do some planning. We're expecting to document that. We're expecting that to be the plan for this particular knowledge area. And we're expecting for that to be incorporated in the overall project plan. Okay, so one of the things we have to do is identify which project needs can best be met by using products or services outside of the organization. Okay, if there's no need to buy any products or services from outside the organization, then there is no need to perform any of the other procurement management processes. This is very important. Okay, so. Um, 
this uh, test is even stricter than you might think, okay? Because there are certain things that organizations uh, procure uh, uh, broadly. Things like uh, office uh, supplies, uh, uh, office uh, space, office furniture, um, uh, copying and printing, uh, electricity, uh, heat and light, those kinds of things, right? Liability insurance. So there are, are kind of basic, almost overhead kind of things. There, there are things that are being bought in the organization all the time. And there typically is a part of the organization that is responsible for buying those things. And typically, if your project or your continuing operation uses those things, you're expected to get them through the normal channels, right? So if that's true, it, it may be true that your project is going to use things that technically come from the outside, but you're not going to be purchasing them. There's a whole mechanism in place to purchase them, and you're going to be like everybody else. You're going to fill out a request. You're going to get whatever your goods and services are, and then um, you're going to get charged for it. Okay, so the real question here is not whether you in a very hyper-technical sense, are going to be using things from the outside, but whether there are further things that need to be bought from the outside that will be the responsibility of the project to procure. Okay? And it's only then that you need to pursue this area. If it turns out that you can get everything that you need through the normal channels within your organization, then there's no procurement to be had at all. Okay? Um, so what kind of things, uh, might you procure from the outside? Well, you know, we're talking about, um, uh, again, again, the text that we're using is for IT, uh, projects. Uh, so for IT projects, we might, uh, we might buy an entire service from the outside. So we might buy an entire solution, kind of like outsourcing. So that'd be a big, uh, procurement. Um, we might buy uh, some software from the outside, either application software or operating system software. Um, we might buy computers from the outside. Um, we might buy services from the outside in terms of professional services. So we might hire some uh, consultants to come in and help us. Okay. Um, we might hire a, an IT services firm to come in and give us a bid on a system and we might buy that, uh, um, we might pay them either a fixed amount or some kind of, uh, time and expenses sort of arrangement for, uh, them doing their work. Let's see, what other kinds of things might we buy? Well, there might be some services like uh, telecommunications, uh, data communications uh, services, those kinds of things that we would have to buy for our project. Um, we might need uh, data center uh, services. Perhaps we're not going to do them internally. We're going to buy them externally. So lots of things that could uh, potentially be bought. Um, in... Uh, in terms of library and information science projects, um, again, there are quite a few of those uh, projects that I involve uh, IT, in which case the same things are going to apply. But in terms of buying things from the outside in, say, the library world, probably the, you know, the biggest thing is, is a new library project. You know, when you're, when you're building a new physical library. You know, we're get, you're going to buy a building, and uh, um, you're uh, you're going to have a building. Uh, you're going to buy property. You're going to design a building. You're going to have it constructed. You're going to fill it up with stuff, and you're going to pay thirty-five million dollars. Well, that's a big buy, right? So there's plenty of stuff to be bought. All right. So. Um, 
one important aspect of the kind of deal that you have with a vendor is what's the nature of the contract type going to be? So different types of contracts can be used in different situations. So um, one group of con uh, contracts is called fixed price or lump sum. Involves a fixed total price for a well-defined product or service. Um, another category is cost reimbursable. Okay, this involves payment to the seller for direct and indirect uh, costs. These can be, uh, these are uh, typical when the buyer retains a lot of control over what's bought, but the seller is expected to do their best to help them control the costs. Uh, time and material contract is, is a hybrid of both uh, fixed price and cost reimbursable contracts, often used by consultants. And unit price uh, contracts require the buyer to pay the seller a predetermined amount per unit of service. And I mentioned um, back when I was talking about General Motors, I mentioned uh, EDS, Electronic Data Systems, and they were... Um, they were really the uh, IT services company that pioneered the idea of unit price uh, contracts. They would, um, they'd have contracts with uh, state governments for, I think, Medicaid claims. I'm trying to think. It was one of the benefits uh, like that. And what they would do is instead of... Um, instead of selling uh, software or systems development, they would actually sell the entire service. So they would say, okay, we'll run Medicaid claims, okay? So we'll not only have the hardware and the software and the operating systems, um, we'll have the office space and the employees and the training. And then we'll, we'll charge you fifty dollars per claim okay unit price they made a lot of money that way so they kind of saw that they they were taking the risk out of the cost for the uh for the state and uh uh being able to being compensated uh handsomely for their their ability to achieve economies of scale. And now, when we talk about these four contract types, we're not saying that one contract, one agreement, one you know piece of paper that people sign can only be of one type. And in fact, uh, it's typical for, in a pretty big uh, procurement, for the contract to have some elements of many of these types. Okay. Uh, now, and when we're talking uh, contracting, a lot of contracting that gets done is uh, contracting that gets done with uh, state, local, and federal government. And state, local, and federal government uh, have uh, have a way of talking about um, contract provisions where they are interested in a point in the the life of the contract which is called the PTA or point of total assumption. It's the cost at which the contractor assumes total responsibility for each additional dollar of contract cost. So um, there may be a flexible arrangement up until a certain point but after that point it's all on the vendor. So contractors, you know, the vendors don't want to reach the point of total assumption because it hurts them financially. So they have an incentive to prevent cost overruns past the PTA. So the PTA is calculated with the formula ceiling price minus the target price over the government share plus the target cost. Okay, so let's talk about cost reimbursable contracts because there are different shades of cost reimbursable contracts. We have cost plus incentive fee. 
The buyer places, uh, it pays the supplier for allowable performance costs plus a predetermined fee and an incentive uh, bonus. Okay, so um, the bill is for the actual cost incurred by the seller uh, plus some fees and some bonuses potentially on top of that. Um, then we have cost plus fixed fee. The buyer pays the suppliers for allowable performance costs, those would be actual costs, plus the fixed fee payment, usually based on a percentage of the estimated uh, cost. Now, this has perhaps even greater incentive for the seller to help control the cost because um, the fixed fee is... Uh, um, typically based on the anticipated costs, okay? So if the seller helps the buyer spend less than they thought, then the fixed fee is a big payment. It's a, a they're getting kind of overpaid. If they can't help the buyer control the costs, then they're getting paid less on top of their actual costs than they would hope for that amount of work. So there is some incentive in there as well. And then we have cost plus percentage of costs. The buyer pays the supplier for allowable performance costs plus a predetermined percentage based on the total cost. So all of, all of the responsibility for the cost is on the buyer. Uh, the seller gets their actual costs plus a markup, okay? Well, you might want to say, well, why would... Uh, why would a buyer ever want to sign up for this? I think it makes sense for buyers who want to retain a lot of control over um, what's going to go on. If they want to be completely in control all the time, then they just uh, kind of want to treat the vendor like a taxi. You know, they want to turn the meter on and turn the meter off when they want to. Uh, and they'll take responsibility for the accumulation of the cost. So, uh, here's a story I talked about already in this, uh, oh, in a recent uh, lecture, which I also uh, recorded today, on risk uh, management. So, uh, contract incentives can be extremely effective. In 2007, in Minneapolis, they lost the bridge over I-35W. Um, there were there was a loss of life and uh, just a lot of damage. So um, they decided to let a contract for the replacement of the bridge um, and to offer incentive fees for the contractor to finish uh, ahead of, of schedule. So the contractors earned a $25 million incentive fee on top of their $234 million contract for completing the bridge three months ahead of schedule. Um, the Department of Transportation justified the incentive payment by saying that each day the bridge was closed cost road users more than $400,000. So they saved the economy $400,000 for an incentive of, uh, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, three months times $400,000, which is, hmm, more money. <laughs> uh, let's see. Three days is a million two. Uh, 30 days is 12 million. Okay. So two months would be 24 million. So uh, they paid 25 million and, and they saved 36, right? So uh, they're ahead. And the contractor had a lot of incentive to make that happen. Okay, so this is not a zero sum game. A lot of people would think about contracting as a, a zero sum game. Um, what, you know, what the buyer uh, gets, the contractor has to lose. And what the contractor gets, the buyer has to lose. Uh, here is a classic example of how 
uh, the buyer and the seller set the incentives up such that the buyer and the seller both won. Okay? It's, it's not a zero-sum game. Okay, so um, here's, a, here's a spectrum of contract types versus the risk. So um, because the buyer and the seller are somewhat splitting the money, uh, the buyer's risk, uh, as, as the seller's risk gets greater, the buyer's risk gets lower and vice versa. So um, the things on the left side of the diagram uh, have a high risk uh, to the buyer and the things on the right side have a low risk uh, to the buyer. Um, so cost plus a percentage of, of cost is a classic just run the taxi meter. Okay, firm fixed price at the other end is the classic fixed fee project. Okay, so why would you not want to, you know, let's say you're a buyer. Well, wouldn't you want everything to be firm fixed price? Well, if you remember when we turned, uh, talked about fixed price, we said that um, it's a fixed, f fixed price contract for a well-defined purchase. So, for instance, if the state of Minnesota is buying a bridge, okay, and the bridge is completely designed, and so they are, um, they know exactly what they're going to get. Well, firm fixed price is a good idea. And actually, they did a fixed price plus incentive. They did FPI. So, um, again, if you're not sure what you want, getting a good deal on something is probably not a good idea. Because, yeah, you'll get something for that price, but it might not turn out to be what you need. Okay? So, that's why you might want to be further left on this uh, slide. To the extent that you don't know what you need, you want to exhibit, um, you want to exert more continuing control throughout the process, okay? When you get all the way to the left, you may be retaining all the risks, but you're also retaining all the control, okay? And what you want to do is you want to dial this in exactly where you want to be. So it's not a case where the buyer ought to think of, um, arrangements on the right side of this as being in their interest and arrangements on the left being not in their interest. It's, uh, they want to dial into the spot that is aligned with what their interests are, but how much control they want to retain. Uh, let's talk about contract clauses. So uh, the contract clauses uh, is just a were a term of art that we use to refer to uh, provisions that are in the text of a contract. So we may call them clauses, but they may be a sentence or a sentence or two. Um, so more appropriately, we might say contract provisions. Um, so if a contract should, should include provisions to take into account issues unique to the project. We can require various education or work experience for different uh, pay rights. So uh, in particular, if we have some kind of IT project where the vendor is going to bring in staff, uh, we don't want to just say, well, we'll pay... Uh, uh, $75 an hour for some people and $150 an hour for some other people. And the only difference is that the $150 hour people are called senior. Well, what does senior mean? Let's put some teeth into the contract. Um, typically, uh, 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 contracts have a termination, f uh, have a termination of provision. So it's a contract a clause that allows the buyer, the buyer or supplier to end the contract. Um, and again, what we want 
in terms of these uh, termini termination uh, provisions is we want them to be fair. Now, one of the interesting things about uh, projects uh, is that the power in projects really shifts over the course of the project. Before the buyer lets the contract, okay, they have all the power. They still have all their money. They haven't hired a vendor, okay? Um, and so they, they have a lot of power, um, but they have a lot of potential. They don't have what they want yet. As they sign up the vendor, the vendor in the beginning of the contract doesn't have a lot of power. But as the contract continues and the vendor uh, completes more work on the contract, um, the cost of terminating the contract for the buyer gets higher and higher because there's always a loss. I mean, e even if your termination clause says, okay, we can, we can terminate this on two weeks written notice, uh, no fault divorce. Okay, fine. But what happens if all the people who are working on the project uh, leave and then uh, the buyer who's already paid some substantial amount of work for the work that's been, uh, amount of money for the work that's been done so far, will they be able to salvage that? Because uh, especially in, uh, in IT contracts, having a, a software that's uh, partially done by some other group that you have to complete, um, it doesn't have a lot of salvage uh, value. So what happens is, and one of the reasons we have these uh, contracts is, the power kind of shifts over the term of the contract from the buyer to the seller. And we want to make sure that our arrangements take that into consideration. Okay, so we have tools and techniques for planning purchases and acquisitions. So we have uh, expert judgment, market research, make or buy analysis. So we could ask experts, we could do research, some of that we might buy from experts or industry soothsayers, and, or we could do some kind of economic analysis of ourselves as to whether we want to make or buy something. Um, now, Here's a make or buy example according to the author, but it isn't a make or buy example. Um, uh, this is a buy or lease example. Okay, so assume that you can lease an item that you need for a project for $800 a day. To purchase the item, the cost is $12,000 plus a daily operational cost of $400 per day. Well, um, you don't have to be great at linear algebra to figure out that there's a there's a crossover point at which it makes uh, sense to buy the item. Okay. So uh, let's see, eight hundred dollars a day. Uh, uh, the daily operational cost is probably the same. So at eight hundred dollars a day. I think you're even at, at about 15 days. Um, I don't know. You only have to pay the operational costs there, but you know, again, it's a classic. Uh, it's a classic linear algebra problem. O okay. Now this isn't make or buy. This is buy or lease. All right. Um. So they do the math here on slide 21, and they say that the crossover point is 30 days. If you need the item for more than 30 days, it makes more sense to buy than to lease. Okay, so um, you don't have a procurement management plan, provided you're going to procure something. If you're not going to procure anything at all, then there's no plan, or it's, it's uh, this short. Uh, short. No procurements are anticipated. End of plan. Otherwise, 
the procurement management plan describes how the procurement processes will be managed from developing documentation for making outside purchases or acquisitions to contract a closure. The contents are going to vary based upon the project needs. Also, okay, this is part of your project plan, right? But maybe you already have a procurement management plan from a prior project that you're going to dust off and tune up and this is going to be it. If you work for a large organization, there may be a procurement management policy and even a procurement department or purchasing department that have policies and procedures. Now this is a double-edged sword, okay? To the extent that you need to go through a formal procurement, having people who understand how to do it, especially how to do it if you work for some kind of a government entity and your, uh, your, uh, you know, your actions are subject to legislation, executive orders, all those kinds of things. You, uh, you know, you're, you're happy to find people who know um, how the process has to go. Um, on the other hand, you are going to need to educate whoever gets involved from any kind of a procurement or purchasing group on what the real needs of your project are. And you can't simply assume that their interests are yours. Yes, they're there to protect your interests, but in the main, they're there to protect the interests of um, uh, the organization overall. And there are a lot of times where they might not completely understand um, your project or how uh, procurements are done in this uh, particular profession or industry. And so, um, while it's great to have these people, you got to keep an eye on them. Associated with a procurement, you will sometimes have a statement of work. It's a description of the work required for the procurement. It essentially identifies the scope of what's going to be purchased. If a, sta a statement of work is used as part of a contract to describe only the work required for that particular contract. It's referred to as a contract statement of work. Uh, a statement of work is a type of scope statement. A good statement of work gives bidders a better understanding of the buyer's expectations. Okay, in a, in a perfect world, we would understand each other's expectations perfectly. So here's a template from the text for a statement of work. Scope of work, location, period, schedule, standards, acceptance criteria, special requirements. Okay. Now, if you're going to buy something with a formal procurement, you may be required to or choose to issue either an RFP, a request for a proposal, or an RFQ, a request for a uh, quote. And, and whether you have to um, is going to depend upon if you're in private industry, what the, what, what the practices are for your organization. If you're part of a government organization, um, it could be that every purchase over a certain amount um, has to be done through this kind of formal process, in which case um, it's not uh, up to you to decide to do it. It's up to you to run it appropriately. So the difference between an RFP and an RFQ is this. A request for proposals are used to solicit proposals from prospective sellers a proposal is a document prepared by a seller when there are different approaches for meeting the buyer needs. So you are proposing an approach as long, and in addition, you are proposing a price and terms and all that kind of stuff, okay? 
Whereas requests for quotes is used to um, to buy things on uh, standard things on standard terms. Okay, so the thing that you're buying is a metric ton of uh, grade A rock salt, and um, uh, you you're going to pay for it uh, delivered uh, dockside in Chicago, Illinois. Okay, so on the basis of those terms, what's your price? Oh, and it, it, it's uh, delivered by the 1st of October uh, 20, 2016. Okay, what's your price per metric ton? That's a request for a quote. Uh, here's a request for proposal template. I'll leave you to read through that yourself. Okay, now, um, if you're going to do some kind of RFP, you have to decide how freely you're going to circulate it. Okay, so um, you have to decide what sources are you going to accept an RFP or an RFQ from. Can anybody bid? In certain uh, government situations, anybody can bid. We advertise the opportunity in the newspaper of record for the state or the county or the village or the city. And then uh, people uh, have uh, fair notice that we're buying something and that they can show up and become part of the process. In other situations, particularly in private in industry, um, you can decide who is going to be allowed to bid. You might not allow everyone to bid. Your time in considering their proposals or their bids is uh, significant. So if you don't feel that an organization is qualified, you don't want to feel obligated to, uh, to have to read their response. Okay. So um, in addition to uh, uh, picking who can respond, it's important to know uh, how you're going to evaluate the responses before um, you even issue the RFP or the RFQ, okay? And so typically you should have some kind of scoring process um, in mind and some kind of, uh, uh, you know, some kind of process for uh, scoring the uh, the uh, proposals or bids and e evaluating them, etc. Beware of proposals that look good on paper. Be sure to evaluate factors such as past performance and management approach. Um, so sometimes what people do is that they require um, that the vendors give uh, three references. And you would think that if a vendor only had to give you three references when you called them up, they'd all be good. But that's not always the case. And it's typical in a case of some kind of IT project to require a technical uh, presentation as part of the proposal. Typically, uh, we would only we'd only have that opportunity available for the top three bidders or uh, something like that. So people who were you know, sort of in the running as the top three or, or the top five would get the opportunity to, to tell you more. Uh, conducting procurement. As I said, you have to decide whom to ask to do the work. You have to send appropriate documentation to the potential sellers. You have to obtain proposals or bids. You have to select a seller. Uh, you have to uh, award a contract. And when you award a contract, you need to negotiate it, right? There are going to be all kinds of language in the contract that uh, needs to be ironed out. Approaches for procurement. Organizations can advertise to procure goods and services in several ways. 
approaching a preferred vendor, approaching several potential vendors, advertising to anyone interested. A bidder's conference can help to clarify the buyer's expectations. So typically what you do is when you say that you're going to have a bid, you'll have a conference um, several weeks before the responses are due where you'll do questions and answers at a bidder's conference. Uh, here's a proposal evaluation sheet. It's a weighted scoring model. Okay, so here we've decided that we're going to give um, technical approach a 30% weight, management approach a 30% weight, past performance a 20% weight, price a 20% uh, weight, so that uh, it, that adds up to a weight of 100%. And then typically we would have people score these things on a scale of maybe 1 to 100. And then we would, um, so somebody who got a perfect score, they got 100 with everything, would have a total score, total weighted score of 100. Seller selections. Uh, organizations often do an initial evaluation of all proposals and bids and then develop a short list of potential, uh, potential sellers for further evaluation. Sometimes it's only those people who get asked to do some kind of uh, presentation and interview. Sellers on the short list often prepare a best and final offer. Now, Best and final offer, or BAFO, is an interesting concept. Um, you can look at it in a, a constructive way, or you can look at it in a cynical way. So let me tell you, tell you the cynical way first. As a vendor for years, um, we would go into these bids, and we would um, we'd give them our best price. And so you would get... Um, you get on the short list. Of course, you don't know where you are on the short list. And we say, well, you're on the short list of three vendors or five. And they say, now we want to see your best and final offer. Well, I always wanted to say, well, you have my best and final offer, right? You're just trying to squeeze extra money out of me, okay? And if all this is is a holdup, then all this is, is a holdup, then say, and the cynicism is appropriate. But you'll remember that in a request for a proposal, not everybody has the same approach, okay? And what can happen is that over the course of presenting your approach, um, the buyer can realize that they like a particular approach and they're going to want to know what it would cost with, with all of the vendors if they took that approach. You know, they realize that it's really nice that the one vendor thought of the approach and maybe they'll give them more credibility for that. But what would it cost if we did it that other way with the other vendors? So sometimes in the best and final offer, they're coming back and saying, okay, here's how we want it. Now give us your best and final offer. And certainly coming up with another number like that is, is not a cynical thing. It's a, it's a way for everybody to get what they want. Uh, the final output is a contract signed by the buyer and the selected seller. Okay, so controlling procurements is an important thing to do. This is a process ensure, that ensures that the seller's performance meets contractual requirements. Contracts are legal relationships, so it's important that legal and contracting professionals be involved in the writing and administering of contracts. Again, this is a double-edged sword, okay? I don't want to say that it's a good thing to act as your own lawyer, although I've done it from time to time, okay? Uh, but um, to the extent that you've got people on your side um, who are contract negotiators for your, your organization or lawyers or external law firms, uh, you have to make sure that they understand what you're procuring. So their advice and counsel and their, uh, 
their experience is very important stuff but you can't just assume that they know the best way to do it you have to be on top of the issues yourself and make sure that you educate them um, another issue that's really important is this I issue of constructive change o o orders which are oral or written contracts or uh, oral or written acts or uh, uh, omissions by someone with actual or apparent authority that can be construed to have the same effect as a written change order. Now, I had a consulting firm that I was one of the principals of, and we shifted over time from doing um, time and expenses uh, contracting to doing more project-oriented and fixed-fee work. And when we're in the more time and expenses kind of approach, well, if the customer wanted something else done, well, you know, they were the boss. You know, we, we'd say it's going to cost a little bit more and they'd say fine and we'd do it and then we would send them the bill. But once we were responsible for managing the cost, well, then... If, in the fact, they asked for something that was a change, it was up to us to say, that's a nice idea, but that's a change. Let's get that in the change control process. And one of the most difficult things for my teams was they weren't used to doing that. So the customer would say, um, what if we change A to B? They go, oh, that's okay. Don't worry about that. Well, what if we change uh, B to C? Well, that's not big. Don't worry about that. Well, sooner or later, it would turn into a lot of work. And then we, if we wanted to come back and say, well, what was originally A is now Z, and we need another $50,000 for it, they would say, well, we talked to your people. They said it was fine. It's a constructive change order. So people who have apparent authority to give... Um, to agree to changes will be seen by the courts to have actual authority to agree to changes. And so you can write as much as you want in the formal contracts. You can say something like, and should say same, uh, something like, any changes have to be written and approved by the original parties. But you really want to make sure on both sides that whoever you have involved in the project is not going to accidentally tell the other side that something's okay to the extent that the other side can come back and say, well, that was a constructive uh, change order that's already agreed to with no difference in price. Here we're going to give you suggestions for change control and contracts. So, uh, we're not only interested in change, change control in the project as a whole, but contracts per se. So uh, changes to any part of the project need to be reviewed, improved, and documented by the same people in the same way that the original part of the plan was approved, just like I said a minute ago. Evaluation of any change should include an impact analysis. How will the change affect the scope, the time, the cost, the quality of the goods and services provided? Changes must be documented in writing. Project team members should also document all important meetings and uh, telephone calls. A telephone phone calls is maybe a little redundant. You don't have to go that far. Telephone calls or phone calls will be sufficient. Project managers and teams should stay closely involved to make sure the new system will meet the business needs and work in an operational environment. We ought to have backup plans. We ought to use tools and techniques such as a contract change control system, buyer-conducted performance reviews, inspections and audits, and so on. So we ought to be pretty darn formal. We ought to be as formal about our outsourcing as we are about our commitments on the project to our stakeholders. And now we're going to talk about closing. So closing procurements involves complete, completing and settling contracts and resolving any open items. Okay, uh, the project team should determine if all work was 
uh, completed correctly and satisfactorily, update the records to reflect final results, archive information for future use. Um, the contract itself should include requirements for formal acceptance and closure. And this is where people often fall down. Um, they typically, if they've had advisors who are good at these kind of contracts, they do have provisions in the contracts for final acceptance and all those kinds of things. But these things they typically say you've got so many days to complain. And if you haven't complained in so many days, you've agreed um, that you've, you've accepted whatever you've bought. So it's important for the contract manager to understand, and, and that's the project manager, it's important for them to understand the terms, particularly the wind up and termination terms of these, uh, these uh, agreements because they need to live within them. Now, when I teach these uh, project management classes in I industry, I typically will ask, okay, uh, how many people here um, have uh, procurements that are part of their projects? And uh, maybe a third of the hands will go up, half of the hands will go up. And I say, okay, how many of you have a copy of the contract? And most of the hands will go down, okay? And this is because we have this kind of idea in most organizations that the big people will deal with the important stuff. You know, the financial people, the general manager, the director, all these people will deal with uh, contracts. And the, um, you know, the little people, the, the uh, people on the project team, including the project manager, will just make sure that things get done. And the contract, that's a big people thing. Well, the problem is, what about all these terms in the contract that your organization has to live by? How are they going to live by them if you don't know about them? So if there's a contract, if there's a procurement associated with your project and there's a contract, you better have a copy of it because you're going to be held responsible for getting the most out of it. Uh, best practice, procurement may, can be more intelligent. Data sciences build predictive models to analyze big data related to finance, marketing, etc. Why not model procurement processes? Uh, behavioral economists, uh, economists know that people do not act rationally. Why not apply irrationality to your advantage in negotiations. Well, that sounds uh, dangerous. Uh, crowdsourcing solicits ideas from large groups of people. Can, can it apply to some of your organization's uh, procurements? So, um, you know, we can think in a more open way about a, a procurement. There's nothing that says that modern information approaches can't improve the process. And tools to assist in contract closure, procurement audits, identify lessons learned in the procurement process, negotiated settlements help to close contracts more smoothly, a records management system provides the ability to easily organize, find, and archive procurement related uh, uh, documents, particularly if you have a, a, a very paper intensive uh, procurement. My wife has been uh, responsible for managing quite a few uh, telecommunications related projects where associated with the project, there are a lot of equipment purchases and uh, there's uh, paperwork on every order. And um, there have been times more in the distant past than in, in, in the close by um, uh, present where um, there'd be different versions of paperwork or uh, we wouldn't know who had the paperwork. 
um, it's really important to make sure that you have complete control over the paperwork associated with your procurement. Uh, using software. Okay, so word processing software helps to write proposals and contracts. Spreadsheets help evaluate suppliers. Databases help track suppliers. And presentation software helps to present procurement related information. E-procurement software does many procurement functions electronically. So those of you who uh, work in higher education would know that to the extent that you're um, putting in uh, proposals for grants, um, it's very common these days to submit the proposal using e-procurement software. Uh, and this is done in all kinds of uh, procurements these days. And organizations also use other internet tools to find information on suppliers or auction goods and services. So there's a lot of possibilities here to bring extra value through uh, well thought through information approaches. Um, so your own individual experience is going to vary a lot. Okay, um, It's entirely possible that you can work as a PM for an entire career at a place that does a lot of projects and um, not have a major procurement that's part of your project. Uh, or you could have a major procurement your first uh, time out. You could, uh, you could be assisting in the management of uh, a new library design and construction project, uh, tens of millions of dollars, and you're right there. Okay, So there's no standard uh, 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 amount of uh, procurement. Uh, it's going to vary project by project. We have a lot of good ideas in here about the elements of this kind of buying and this kind of contracting and the kind of documents and rights and responsibilities uh, that are here. I think it's a good introduction and to the extent that you really get one of these uh, major procurements on your hand, there are a lot of other resources available uh, that help to educate you appropriately. So with that, I'm going to say uh, goodbye uh, for the course. This is uh, uh, the last of the chapters that we're going to cover. This is uh, chapter 12. We already covered chapter 13 earlier. Um, it's been great uh, working with you guys, and I look forward to uh, discussions with you about the lecture as we have with the other lectures. And I'm going to say bye-bye.